Judges chapter 14, verses 10 through 20. We're in part three of our message series entitled Samsonite versus Kryptonite. And you know, uh, it's, it's a funny thing because Hollywood seems to be enamored with all these comic book, um, you know, super, super heroes and all that. And the latest one, what is it, X-Men or something like that? X-Men Apocalypse and there was Batman versus Superman. And, but I want to let you know about a true um, biblical hero superhero and that is Samson and we're doing a mess series based on the life of Samson and today it's found in Judges chapter 14 verses 10 through 20. Judges chapter 14 verses 10 through 20. I know those are lengthy verses but it's a wonderful story of it's like a Hollywood scripted story of what goes on and so I want to make sure that we read it just so you could get the context of what's going on and from this I'll be able to preach. Judges chapter 14 10 through 20. If you found it like as a call a response to church somebody say aloud amen okay. <laughs> Let me read out loud God's holy word if, you, if you'll suddenly read along with me. His father, that is Samuel's father, went down to the woman, that is the woman, that a Philistine woman that, uh, that Samson wanted to marry. And Samson prepared a feast. Everybody say feast. Okay. Yes. Prepared a feast there. For so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. What Samson's talking about is the fact that linen garments are undergarments outer garments the outside so it's a, like a complete suit like a men's suit like a complete thing the whole wardrobe right there he's talking about that 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes and they said to him put your riddle that we may hear it and he said to them out of the eater came something to eat out of the strong came something sweet and in three days they could not solve the riddle on the fourth day they said to Samson's wife entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is lest we burn you and your father's house with fire there's some friendly neighbors there aren't they right. have you invited us here to impoverish us and Samson's wife they're not legally technically married but it was like an engagement which is very very close so that's why they're saying Samson's wife but he hadn't consummated yet and Samson's wife wept over him and said you only hate me you do not love me you have put a riddle to my people, and you have not told me what it is. And he said to her, Behold. I don't know how many husbands ever say that to your wives when they're like, you know, pouring their hearts. Behold. <laughs> but this is what's saying. Behold, I have not told my father nor my mother. And shall I tell you? But she wept before. <laughs> you don't love me. If you love me, you'll tell me. She wept before him the seven days. That's a long time. Point to someone and say, that's a long time, all right? <laughs> that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he gave in and he told her because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer. In other words, morning, using more vernacular, if you had not messed with my fiance, you would not have found out the riddle. Verse 19, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men, this is a town further away, 30 men of the town, and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house and Samson's wife, or realistic, more realistically, fiance, was given to his companion who had been his best man. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would now allow these words about a historical event that happened thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago 
would you, Lord God, make it come alive today? And may it give life to those who are dying, to those whose areas are dying, may it speak your spiritual life. And I pray that as a result, that there, everyone may hear, may be fed nothing but the word of God, and they may be strengthened, set free, and Lord God, may hold by that. Lord, I offer myself to use me now as your mouthpiece and use your people to be hearers of your word who will be doers of it as well. To that end, we commit this time and this cause in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, today, we read upon a, like a Hollywood scripted story here. It's about the idea about Samson being so gifted and talented. And you know, I want to just start out by saying this. Giftedness does not guarantee success. Talent, no matter how much, how good your talent is, does not guarantee victory. Ability, everybody say ability, okay? Say it even louder, ability, okay? Ability doesn't guarantee reaching your full potential. It only reveals the possibility of that full retention. And so it is in the strongest man in the whole wide world, Samson. Samson, who had the gift, God-given gift of physical human strength and powers. He was gifted with power, but he was also gifted with brains. So, brains and brawn. If he was in high school or college, he was probably all-American or all-Israelite on the team. He was someone that was the star athlete in all the sports that he did. But he was also valedictorian of his class, graduating magna cum laude. He was the apex in terms of he was a very bright and clever and strong uh, mind in his mind, but it was also he was very strong in his prowess right there. And so we come to this man, and, but we see something amazing. As much as God had given him with the brain and with the strength, as talented and as gifted and smart and clever that he was, all by God's grace and all by God's blessing, he never fully reached his full potential and full success. Why? Because he had all that ability, but not much to account for as he lived primarily for himself and not for God's purpose. He had ability, but not accountability. And that's why I want to share with you today through several points that through Samson's life, we learn how important accountability is to reaching your full ability. Everybody take your right hand and finger, stretch it out to the heavens above. We do this every Sunday, so don't get rusty on me now and let's make June gloom be doomed here in this place. So everybody take, receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you with gusto and passion find three people and point at that person and say it to them and say it like you mean it. Your ability is based on your accountability. Say it like you mean it, me like you say it, all right? Your ability is based on your accountability. And that's why the sermon title is Account ability. And I think God has a wisdom in terms of why he puts some words together in that way. I want to share with you three points about that, about how we need to give an account for all the abilities. And when we do so properly, according to God's wisdom, we see our abilities shining to the full potential right there. The first thing I want to share with you is that what you feast on, everybody say feast on, okay? What you feast on regularly will determine your heart and your outcome. What you feast on regularly will determine your heart and your outcome. Verse 10 says it right here. His father went down to the woman that Samson wanted to marry, and Samson prepared a feast there for so the young men used to do. That was the primary thing of that culture of that day. And one of the things that you don't get in the English translation is simply this. This is more than a feast. In the typical culture for a wedding feast that lasted seven days, it was basically a seven-day drinking binge party. It was so filled with wine. Everybody realized it's the time that the guy who was getting married celebrated with all his friends. And the way that they do so, he provided lots of food, but also lots of wine. Most scholars say, even agree to this saying, that Samson, because he was the bridegroom, was expected to encourage his guests to enjoy themselves. And therefore, the word feast means a drinking party. And so he was breaking now a second part of his Nazarite vow. Two weeks ago, we realized he was not supposed to touch anything unclean. He broke that. He was set apart for God. And today, in this past, we realize he's breaking another part. He will not drink anything that comes from the grapevine. 
And he's doing it all because he wants to live and enjoy his life in that way. And the word feast, like I said, it means a drinking party. But I want to also say this, because all of you have gifts and strengths and talents from God. At the same time, you're all taking things in. And I want to say this, even your greatest strengths need strength. Even your greatest strengths need strength. Because just because you have it doesn't mean anything. We're always feeding and fueling our strengths as well as our weaknesses. And that's why your strengths need and gifts need God's anointing. Can I get an amen to that, right? And your heart is consumed with whatever it gives its energy and strength to. Your strengths are fueled by what your heart consumes. Let me try to make it practical. If your heart is consumed with sports and all you watch is ESPN Sports Center, then whenever you watch it, you're thinking about it all the time. You get energized by that. But once your wife starts reading to you Shakespeare poetry, you shrivel up right there in energy. If your energy is going shopping to the malls, like some of you people, you get energized. But I love the department stores that has seats for husbands. Because I realize sometimes my wife loses track of time. It becomes infinite. And this was before the day of smartphones. And I would be waiting. And then I remember coming upon one department store. And there was a round seat. And I said, what have we here? I don't see any clothes on it for like display. And I sat on it. And I thanked the Lord. I was there for like 30, 40 minutes. And it seems to be a male attraction magnet because all these other guys came and we sat down and we waited and waited and waited and waited right there. Some of you get your energy from shopping. If your heart is consumed with, God forbid, I said something funny, but pornography. Your mind is thinking about that all the time. And you get consumed and you're feeding your strength, your passion was supposed to be holy. And you're feeding with that and it perverts it in a wrong way. I know I'm already starting to preach already. It's just the beginning of the message here. If your heart is consumed with money, then you're energized and driven by that. If your heart is consumed with praise, then your heart is consumed with praise. If your heart is consumed with God's word, then your heart is consumed and driven by God's word. Can you get an amen to that? We're always feeding and strengthening our strengths. Even your holy strengths and gifts and talents that God's given to you. You either feeding to something that's from God or not of God. And that's why the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee in Psalms. If your heart is consumed with God's church, then your heart is consumed for the church and to making God's kingdom grow. If your heart is consumed with the kingdom of God, then your heart will be consumed with the love of King Jesus. And everything you do, you do it for the glory of God. And so that's why we're always feeding ourselves. And let me ask you, throughout, not just on Sunday from 11 to 12.30 on service, and I want to say this out of love, what is your primary feeding from? Is it Oprah? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? Because some of you say, I don't want to have any time for quiet time, but I see you have more than enough time on Facebook. Is it some other thing? But we're always feeding ourselves with that. And let me ask you in this way. If you came and you're a little down, God's going to pick you up because God's grace is here. Can I get an amen to that, right? But Monday through Saturday, you're feeding. And whatever your strengths and weakness are, whatever you're feeding, it, if you're feeding with the right and proper thing, you will be strengthened in the Lord. You'll be strengthened. The joy of the Lord shall be your strength, it says. And that's why you are the product of what you're feasting on. And Samson wanted to feast on the things that God said, I've given you a boundary, don't do this. For you to reach your maximum potential, can you stay away from the fruit of the vine? But he just wanted to get married to a Philistine woman, and he wanted to throw a wedding binge party for seven days, and therefore he was starting to drink and break that vow even further. And it was feeding even his physical strength with things that should not have been, but rather he should have been feeding himself with something else. You see, we all know this. We're the product of not just what you do, but what you feast upon. You are the product of not just what you do. You could come to church every Sunday. Clap your hands, raise your hands. 
Why aren't you seeing so much progress and results that you're wanting? It's because sometimes what you're feasting on. It's about diet. Everybody say diet. Okay? Say it even louder. Diet. Okay? I'm talking about not just a physical diet, but also a spiritual diet as well. It's not just actions. No matter how many actions and exercise you put into it, but it's also what your diet is. You know, some of you may be exercising once a month. Some of you once a week or twice a week or three times a week or five times a week. But have you noticed that after a while, no matter how many times you exercise per week, you don't see the results that you really wanted? Right? You do the same thing, but you don't see the same results. And some of you know this. When I got married, I'm not kidding, I was 126 pounds when I got married on my wedding day. Came back from a mission trip. I lost all this weight. You could see, and, and my wife said, you're too skinny and all that. But because I had the gift of eating, because I had such a fast metabolism, I could eat anything. I would be eating Popeye's chicken like three or, to- three or four times a week. Buffalo wings. And then when we were married, I uh, got married, my wife was a great cook. I would come home late and she would cook me all this Korean food. I would eat it late at night. And I'm not kidding, within the next uh, six months of marriage, I gained 30 pounds. And it got so bad. I mean, I was able to, you know, some people gain weight in the certain areas. I gained it all in my neck. I don't know why. God makes me gain weight in my neck. So when I was preaching, I got this double chin, and this one guy took a picture. And since I'm going to blackmail you with this picture, Pastor. <laughs> so please, no, and, and it just looks really, really bad. I was like preaching really loud, and you see this double chin. But in other areas, I was able to hide it. And, and so, you know, um, I stopped exercising a little bit. And I thought, hey, you know what? It, it doesn't show. It doesn't look that bad. And then my neck was showing, and I remember my dad hadn't seen me in a while, and I saw him at, at, at the church parking lot. He rolled down his window and said, Steve, what happened to you? <laughs> Self-control. Self-control. And as a result of that, you know, I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to, my metabolism is slowing down. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to start exercising. And I still was able to see some improvements. It didn't make as much of an improvement. Now that I'm 48 years old, <laughs> exercise four or five times a week. I'm disciplined. I do all the activity. I sweat. I've done even P90 de- P90X for 60 days only, but not, not full, but I don't know. I've done all that stuff. But what I realize is I don't see the results. Not as much. And you know why? No matter how much physical activity I put, if I didn't change my physical diet, I will not see the results that I want. In the same way, you could have all the spiritual activity come in the church. But if you're not feasting upon the right spiritual diet, you won't see as much results. Are you track with me? Can I get an amen to that? All right. So that's why it's important for all of us here to understand what are you taking in? And that's why we want to encourage you. Get plugged into a spiritual community that encourages you. Because Monday through Saturday, you may be hearing the live enemy saying, you're not going to amount to much. Your life is all messed up. God has forsaken you. Look at you. You're all out by yourself and your friends who party all night long. These seem to be getting ahead in life. And look at your life. You got to church on time this past Sunday. But your friend who missed church because he went out drinking got a promotion and you did it. You may be hearing the lies of the enemy. And you're feasting upon that. You're feasting upon news. Have you noticed all the news is so negative these days? Very rare is it positive. And you're feasting upon all these things. And you come and your life and your joy is sucked out. But when God says, when you feast upon the Lord, taste and see that the Lord is good. Hello, I'm preaching to somebody here today. What you take in, you become. What you feast on becomes a part of you. If you eat nothing but in and out, you'll have an in and out body. If you eat nothing but Krispy Kreme donuts, you will have a Krispy Kreme body. But when you take in God's word, you will have a holy Bible spirit filled body in Christ. And so that's why it's important what you feast upon even further. And that's why it's so important that you put yourself in a community that you could be fed, that you could be encouraged, that you could be spoken life to into in that way. And that's why I'm not here to tout our church, but I am thankful because I have traveled around and seen churches. I'm so thankful. 
saints here in revival, you don't know how good God has blessed us. We don't know how good God has blessed us with mighty, wonderful, spirit-filled praise. With a 40-some-odd-year-old uh, worship pastor that still jumps up and down and gets his shirt sweaty just like I do when I preach. Amen. That has an operatic singer <laughs> singing glory for the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know how good it has. All our small groups are doing well. People loving and encouraging one another in that further. And then as a result, that's why it's so important that you feast and taste and see what the Lord has placed in your life. That's why we have people, and I want to make a call. We have crazy people coming from Torrance, from South Bay. Let me hear a shout out from Torrance, folks. <laughs> Driving an hour or so because they want to get feasting upon God's word here. We have people from Corona. Let me hear from Corona right here, right now. I mean, another crazy from the other side, from the east side, driving an hour. We have some people from LA, downtown or Keaton. Can I hear from those from LA right now? <laughs> going through the five, going through all that construction traffic, which has been around forever. Almost as long as God's word, it seems like. <laughs> and they still come on down. We have some people coming from San Diego. Some people come from Loma Linda. And we have a family coming, driving one way, 78 miles one way from Castaic. I said, Castaic what? Castaway? What are you talking about? What is it called? We have someone drive. Why? Because the importance of spiritually feasting right. You want to go and just say you went to church or you want to be challenged by God's word, transformed by it, molded by it, so you become a more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important that we feast. And what you feast upon, you will eventually become. And Samson had all the gifts, but he feasted upon the wrong things. So what you feast on regularly will determine your heart condition and also your outcome. So point to someone and say, have the right feast, have the right feast, have the right feast. Second thing I want to share with you is this, because we live in such a, in our country, culture today, such an individualistic society that idolizes and epitomizes independence and individualism. Victory may be achieved individually, but it cannot be maintained alone. Your own gifts and your strengths may allow you to reach a certain level of success and victory. But I guarantee you this, you will not be able to maintain it or sustain it unless it's done through community. You can't maintain it alone. It was not meant to be that way. Where do I get this? Verses 11 to 14. As soon as the people, the Philistines saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, let me put now a riddle to you if you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast. Do you know what's going on? Samson, who probably graduated valedictorian. Samson, who was so well respected because he was such a, a bright guy, but also a strong guy. He had no friends. When he's getting married, he couldn't find any brothers to be his groomsmen. How sad is that? I'm so strong. I'm anointed by God. I'm gifted by God. Hey, I'm getting married. Who's going to be in your wedding party? I don't have any. So the Phil's like, hey, we'll get you 30 guys. These will be your groomsmen for the next seven, seven days of wedding feast. And he's having this. And he thinks he's so clever. He comes up, let me give you a riddle. And if you get this, I'll give you 30 sets of clothes. If you get it wrong, you'll get me 30 sets of clothes. And he's thinking that by his strength and giftedness, he could be victorious and sustain it. But then we realize the story, as we read, he eventually falls into that of defeat. Samson's so strong individually, but this led him to think that individual victory, when it's not shared as a blessing to others, becomes an isolated area of vulnerability. Victory and strength without accountability is a great weakness. But get this, victory and strength with accountability is a great multiplying victory. That's why it's so important that we get connected with the right people and encourage each other even further. Before the worship service started, you know, my wife came to me. You know, at the last Rev Hop, one of the brothers who was going through panic attacks, remember? My wife came to me, you know this brother? And she said the uh, brother's name. He told me today... Ever since getting prayed for a rev up, he's no longer having those panic attacks. Let's give God a praise, hand clap of praise for that. 
Why? It's because when the body of Christ comes together, there's power numbers. And when you share the victory with others, just like I said did, it releases faith, it releases hope, it releases love, it releases unity in the body of Christ. And when that happens, there's no room for the devil to come in. And that's why it's important for all of us to understand that, it's a, that the crucial need that you can have uh, levels of success by your individual gifts, but you have to share it. It can't be maintained alone. You need to share it with the body of Christ. You see, it's when you have accountability that you can count on your own ability to really thrive. Accountability does not hinder your ability. Accountability is what protects your ability. Let me say that again. Accountability does not hinder your ability. Rather, accountability protects your ability. Think about it this way. As many of you know, I, I, can't have the gift, I don't have the gift of singing. I prayed three times to the Lord. I asked the Lord, would you give me the gift of singing? And, my, and the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient for you, right? <laughs> for my strength is made power in your weakness, right? But if we had four talented um, singers, Danny, the opera singer, Sister Hannah, Yeno, the jazz singer, Pastor Sam, and uh, they're all singing, and they're all gifted, and they're all strong. But say Yeno wants to start saying, you know what, uh, I have this given talent, uh, I'm going to sing the song jazz style. Same song, everyone's singing. And then Danny goes, my strength is opera style. So as Yeno's singing jazz, you know, Danny's like, Ooh! The Hannah who sings with her heart, she starts crying and just weeping before the Lord. And Pastor Sam's like, I, I, I get energized when I jump up and down. <laughs> so while Hannah's like somber, really poor, and he's like jumping up and it would look terrible. People would be like, you guys are not together. So it is in God's gift and this in strength. You can have and say, hey, I, I'm, I'm jumping up. I'm being victorious. But for the team, the team is not victorious. And so when you work together, when you have your moment, you shine in the right context at the right moment. When it's your turn, you shine and you use your gifts in the right context. When it's your turn, some of you are tired of waiting for God. But God knows what he's doing because he's the best conductor of all. If you can't connect the music, it's like a basketball team. Everybody wants to shoot out and use their gifts, but unless you use the right place that their coach gives you, when your time is up, you could use it right there. But when you use it together, that's when the whole team wins. When everybody's trying to have their own individual victory, you may have it, but the whole team loses in the end. That's why some of you are waiting for God to just come through, wait for the Lord, and be faithful where God has placed you. That's when you can understand that what good is having individuals? You have to share it corporately amongst the body of Christ. Are you track with me? Can I get an amen to that? And that's why it's so important that Samson, as strong as he was, he was weak in accountability. Then listen to his mother and father. He didn't even have any brothers, friends. May I encourage you? It's so important for you sisters to find other sisters in Christ that will speak life and truth and hope into you. Instead of the superficiality of just talking about bees and whatever. I don't, I don't know. What do you guys talk about? I don't know. Shop. I don't know what you guys talk about or ladies talk about. And you guys. Hey, hey, hey. What do you, you think about Stephen Curry? His shoes, they're ugly, aren't they? Whatever. And you say all these things, right? But you need some brothers. And you know, I'm going to be honest. I'm so thankful for my board of directors at this church. They keep each other accountable. Honestly sharing and praying for one another. It's such an important thing in that way. And we speak life and we speak things to try to guide each other and keep us from making mistakes right there. And therefore we share that unity and therefore that victory even further. And it gives us discernment. Everybody say discernment. Okay. John Maxwell says the sermon is, is the ability to see through the right to the heart of the matter. Amongst all the confusion, all the storms, you're able to see right through it. And that's why it's so important for us to be able to understand that you need to be able to maintain the victories by sharing with other people. Or else you'll lack discernment, and whatever victory you'll have will be short-lived. You know, I read this true story. This is an amazing thing, how many of us think that we're so smart. There was a young man who noticed that across from his house... There was a bowling alley. I don't know how many of you like bowling, but there was a bowling alley. And he noticed that every Friday morning at 10 a.m., 
An armored car will pull up in front of the bowling alley that was directly across from his house. And then a uniformed guard will come out of that armored car, go inside the bowling alley, and come out with a, a couple of minutes later carrying three or th two or three bags of money. It probably was the entire weeks of receipts and, and, and cash. The young man, all of a sudden, thought he was so clever, he felt that surely he could actually jump out of the bushes, hold up the driver, and disappear into the woods and rob by taking those bags run into the woods behind the bowling alley in ten, within 15 seconds. So he kept watching for months, studying what time he came, how long it took. He realized that the, the driver would take three minutes going inside the building, and then three minutes exactly later, he would come on out with the bags. So he timed it, and he measured it. And he thought, if I hold them up, and I take the bags, I could run right behind the building, go into the thick forest bushes there, and then go right and run, and then go to my car, and then pull over, and then by the time the police officers came, I could pull into my driveway, and I'll be drink putting my feet up and drinking a can of beer, he thought to himself, and look out when the cops come right there. So he thought he, he could do this, and the moment came, that Friday came, and he put on nothing but a black suit, and he put on a ski mask parked his car behind the forest area, went through the forest, and came to the bushes right where the bowling alley was. And sure enough, like clockwork, the armored car came, and then the driver went in. Three minutes later, he was coming out, and he was walking toward his armored car. The guy pulled out with a shotgun and said, stick it up, give me those bags. And the man turned around, his wide-eyed, put his arms in there and dropped the bags. And then the robber took what looked like the heaviest bag, and he grabbed it, and he realized it was a lot heavier than he thought. So he decided, I can't grab the other bags, this is too heavy. He grabbed one, the largest bag, and he started running through the woods, and he thought, this is so heavy, this must be like a million bucks inside this bag. And he went to the forest, went to his car, put it in the trunk, and he pulled up into his house, and then the, the robbed armored uh, car driver was so shocked, he ran into the bowling alley, found the manager and said, you're not going to believe what just happened. I've just been robbed by a guy in black outfit and a ski mask with a shotgun. And the manager of the bowling alley said, what? Did he take your wallet? No, he took that dirty bag of dirty towels. <laughs> it was not an armored truck. It was a laundry car. And all those bundles were dirty laundry. I don't know about you, but how many of us thought we were so clever, so smart, we could do something and it falls flat in our faces in that way? Much in the same way with Samson right here, he thought, and hey, let me give you a riddle, riddle right here, what comes out, what is strong like this and sweet as this? And so the Philistine 30 men were perplexed, like, what, what is it, what is it? And this is how they were to their own people. They went to Philistine, uh, the Philistine woman that Samson wanted to marry and said, if you don't tell us the answer to this riddle, we're going to burn you and your father's house down right now. So she caved in, and then Samson, after all this constant nagging, finally gave in, and he did that, and he had to actually go and give those 30 sets of clothing to those Philistine men right there. And you know, it's so important that we understand that maintaining this accountability is so important. And that's why we have small groups. And some of you ask, why do we ask questions that kind of make us share? It's because we want to make sure that community really comes. You come into unity together, and you support one another. Where else are you going to get it? And that's why it's so important to have it in the body of Christ. Can I get an amen to that right now? So point at someone next to you and say, let's do it together. Let's do it together. It has to be maintained, all right? The third and final point I want to share with you is the fact that, um, that you have to fight the right battle. Everybody say right battle. And also the right enemy. Everybody say right enemy, okay? Say it even louder, right enemy, all right? Verses 19 to 20 says this, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, Samson, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, next week, you don't want to miss it because the sermon title is The Pros and Cons of Passion. There is a positive side to passion that God gives. There's also a negative side, but I'm going to cover that next week. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. And what we see here from verses 19 to 20 is that you shouldn't be trying to marry the enemy. 
What God had gifted Samson for to fight the Philistines and deliver his people, the Israelites, he was instead trying to have a married relationship with them instead. When you compromise what God has called you to do, you compromise God's promise to be fulfilled in your life. Compromise always involves your heart because it always deals with the promise. And when you are willing to just make little amends here and there, that means you're going to actually be fighting the wrong enemy and fighting the wrong battle in that way. You need to be accountable with the right people and not your enemies. Wherever God has called you to and placed you right now, I want to challenge you. Be faithful to that. Wherever, however, God has placed you with, be faithful to the Lord in that way. That's how you fight the Lord's battles. Because doing everything for not some boss, human boss, but for your ultimate boss, and that is God Almighty up in heaven. When you do it that way, that's when you fight the right battle and the right enemy. And that's why we're at war. And I want to challenge all of you. Someone is after your marriage. Someone is after your kids. The devil doesn't want your kids to become all that God wants them to be. Someone is after your family unity and all that. Someone is after your job and your career and God's calling. Someone is after that. And that's why it's important for all of us to get together and pray together, praise together, worship together, encourage one another, strengthen one another, and get upon God's word even further as a result of that. Because when you are able to be faithful to the Lord and see from God's perspective, you find out what your real enemy is. Your real enemy isn't your boss at work. It's the devil who's trying to rob you of joy at your work right now. He's trying to rob you of giving your best to God wherever you are right now. Because you should understand, your real boss is God and not that human boss. Your real enemy is not your spouse, but the devil is trying to rob, kill, and destroy your marriage. That's why, have you noticed that some generations, if there's been divorce, it seems to happen in the next generation. But I'm here to declare the word of the Lord. God is the curse breaker in Jesus' name. God has come that if your family has been growing up in broken homes, we say no more. We plead the blood of Jesus upon it right now. And from this generation on, it shall be generations of faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get a loud amen to that? If you've been delinquent and your kids have run away, no more in Jesus' name. This day, no longer prodigals, but prodigies of faith in the mighty name of Jesus. So understand who your real enemies are. Your real enemy isn't your parent for those of you who are in youth right now. It's the devil who's trying to rob you of your generational blessing that's supposed to be passed down from your parent onto you. And have you noticed that, that Elijah and all those that submitted to those that God placed above them, when they honored them, then the generational blessings and the anointing came down and flowed down. But when someone was like, give it to me right now, I deserve this, then it seems like the anointing seems to pass over them. So it's important that we understand what our true enemy is. Your real enemy isn't going to church because Christians, you think, don't have real fun. Let me tell you the truth. Christianity is the most joyful thing that you could ever do. You don't have to go to a rave party to feel good. You don't have to drink to act like you're mature and get drunk to feel like you're actually someone that's independent right there. You don't have to go out and meet some guy that you don't even know who may look like they have all those muscles and dress nice, but they got nothing up there in their brains anyway. anyway. You don't have to be impressed with someone who drives a nice car but isn't going anywhere. You got to find out what your real enemy is. And the devil is trying to say, don't go to church. Why go to church? Just stay out on a Saturday. Get drunk. Come home late. Wake up late and all that. And it's going to be okay. But what you're realizing, you're feasting your soul upon the wrong things. Have you noticed that God is so wise? Why do you feel so bad after you get drunk? If it was a good thing, you should wake up. <sighs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I got inebriated last night. and so for, Therefore, my brain seems to be going up several notches higher. My IQ and all that. And my energy level is that much stronger. Praise be to God. No. God's trying to tell you that's not the right way. You're like, uh, give me a five-hour energy pill or whatever. You, you got to understand what your real enemy is. Can I also go a little deeper? Your real enemy is not 11 o'clock start time for church. The devil's trying to say, oh, it's too early. It's too early. You, you know, it's too hard. Really? If we said we're going to have a beach picnic at 8 a.m., you'll be there. (laughs) 
If your boss is show up for it, you'll be there on time. But it's so important that, well, how can we put things for other things, for our own personal desires, but for God, we put it as a second thing as a result of that. You know, your enemy isn't the distance to church. Think about it. You drive two to three hours to go to a Beyonce concert or a Drake concert. I don't even know what, he, what songs he makes these days. I'm just trying to be hip with the crowd right now. I'm trying to understand that. I do understand a little bit about pop culture right now. I don't even know what songs. You could play right now. I'd be like, I don't know who that is, all right? You drive two or three, you could drive two or three hours to go to a nice restaurant. You're even willing to do that, but when it comes to a distance of, oh, man, it's 30 minutes away from church. Man, this is too far. I'm going to waste a lot of gas. Gas prices are too high, Pastor, and I, I don't feel like that's the right thing to do. But you see that that's what the devil's trying to say, like try to detour you and place all these things. And can I also say this? Your enemy isn't your lack of blessings. Your enemy isn't that God hasn't given you enough opportunities. God has given plenty of opportunities. But the thing is, when you're feasting upon, determines your heart, and many of you miss out on the blessings that God has placed in your life. You see, sometimes we don't realize it, but the enemy deceives you into thinking that you have to just wait for all these blessings to come. But can I challenge you with this? In all my years of life in ministry, when God gives us blessings, we want it all nicely packaged, nicely wrapped, all finished product. But God's greatest blessings to us are not finished blessings, but opportunities. He gives us opportunities. But we don't want opportunities. We want the finished product. But God gives us opportunities. I tell my son this because he plays sports. Kyle's like, should I ask God to give me a home run? Great hit. I tell him, no. God won't give you a home run. But he'll give you nice juicy pitches to smack that ball and hit it and drive it. He'll give you an opportunity. See, God is so interested in allowing you to participate in the work of the kingdom of God. He wants you, he gives you opportunities. Your marriage is an opportunity to honor the Lord. Your children, when you're studying, it's an opportunity to honor God. You want straight A's, and can I just speak to all the millennials? You want everything to come easy. Can I just speak love and truth to you? You got to work hard, baby. You want to make good money? You got to study hard. You want to get a good job? You got to work your tail off. You cannot come to work at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning when your work hours at 9 a.m. You can't tell people, hey, I, I work 40 hours, but boss, I don't have enough time. And the boss sees you coming in at 11 o'clock every day. And you're not able to get the work done. It's when you're actually able to do everything in excellence, that's when you're able to go out even further. Can I get an amen to that, right? So we have to understand that God gives us opportunities. Today is an opportunity. You have come to worship the Lord our God. Are you blind to it and saying, God, my life isn't what it is. My finances are what it is. My marriage is what it is. My kids are what it is. And you're coming with this mindset because you've been feasting upon the wrong. Or can you come and say, this is an opportunity from God. That I will extol the Lord and magnify his holy name. That instead of getting drunk on a Saturday, I'm going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instead of going to a rave dance party, I'm going to be jumping up and down praising my Lord Jesus Christ. And then instead of trying to go and trying to look in presence of someone else, I could come into this body and feel so loved and accepted just the way that I am. And know that perfect love casts out all fear. And it's in that type of mindset that I want to challenge all of us that we need to fight the right battle and fight the right enemy. You see, opportunities come, but you miss out on it. You know, I want to get Revival Church to get this. Every time you gather to pray, every time you gather for small groups, every time you gather to church, it's an opportunity for victory that's shared in the body of Christ. And if you miss out on it, let me be honest with you, it's not because the worship pastor didn't prepare. It wasn't because the preacher didn't. It's because you missed out on the opportunity. God gives us every Sunday an opportunity to draw closer to him. 
And whenever you draw closer to him, it is that much more victorious even further. God gives you opportunity. Everybody say opportunity. All right? Point to someone and say, God's giving you an opportunity. God's giving you an opportunity. God's giving you an opportunity. God's giving us an opportunity. And it may not be exactly what you're expecting. But be faithful wherever God has placed you because that is an opportunity. Many of you know that when I... Uh, the L.A. riots from 1992 happened and there was all this discord. African Americans and Korean Americans at discord and Korean merchants shooting during the looting time. Some of you know that I, I was called into the ministry and I felt when I, when I was going to seminary, I felt God was saying, I want you to go and, and work in the area of racial reconciliation. I want you to go. And, and so during seminary, I found an African American church. And many of you know, I love the African American church. I love black gospel. That's why I could clap different rhythm and all that. I can't sing, but I could clap in rhythm. And they were, they were impressed by that. Oh, we thought you couldn't clap in rhythm, but you could actually clap all right. They know I could sway and clap and all that. And I love the African-American style of preaching. And like I said, I'm glad that, you know, we have wonderful uh, musicians. I heard that um, uh, one of the brothers here who's recently joined the worship team, he could play a little bit of gospel. So I'm waiting for the day when I'm going, can I get an amen? The organ sound. Mm -hmm. right? I'm all waiting for that to happen. But as I was uh, doing the, uh, serving at an African-American church, you may be thinking, man, you must have had so many opportunities to preach and to learn and to hone your gifts and your skills. I was there for almost two and a half, three years. Do you know how many times I got to preach? Three times. Three times. You think that the opportunities comes by a lot. God gave different opportunities. I was submitting myself to the senior pastor who was my mentor. And he was making me, hey, you're really anointed in preaching. I have to, why don't you lead worship? And I tried leading worship. He said, stick to preaching instead, brother. <laughs> but he only gave me two more opportunities. I would come early, help set up. I would do all these things. And then he came to me and said, Brother Stephen, I want you to lead a Sunday morning Bible study. Okay, I'm a seminary. And the class was senior citizen women. A 25-year-old teaching senior citizen women about life. I still remember I had to prepare about life of Joseph. Some of them are divorced, remarried, and all that. I'm like, you know, we've got to stay for purity. They're like, mm-hmm, brother, see, that's right, that's right. I'm thinking, you should be teaching me. Here I am trying to teach you. And I could have easily asked God, where are my opportunities? How come I'm not getting more opportunities to preach? That's, that's my primary, the, the past people, that's my primary gifting. Why? And I can wonder about that, but I don't want you to miss this. The enemy is not God has closed doors to you. God has given you doors and opportunities, but you're missing out on it because they're minor things. And I realized, in hindsight, it was by learning how to lead a senior citizen Bible study, I could minister to someone much older than me. It was by coming and doing setup, I could appreciate, as our church is starting, I thank and I'm mindful of every person. I came in and I saw Daniel out there with Ann putting that stake in there for the sign. Not taking it for granted. Knowing how the church operates. And just like we think our main strengths and our talents, we just want to be accountable with that. But have you noticed? I'm going to have someone over today and I'm going to grill some steaks. I'm sorry, we're not going to have steaks for lunch today after church, but it's all right anyway. Just... But what makes the main thing shine? The salt and pepper. The small things. And it's the seasoning that makes the main thing better. So I want to challenge you that it's the small opportunities that God's given to you. That you think, I should have this main thing, but when you're faithful in the little things, it seasons everything in the main thing in your life. And so whatever you've been waiting for for the Lord, I want to challenge you. Be faithful with even the things that God has stewarded to you. And the anointing and the gifting will all come together. The marginal things that God steward to you are opportunities. When you're faithful in that, God puts it together and makes the main things shine for the glory of Jesus Christ. Are you receiving that here today? I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will give an account of all your abilities, not by trying to do things in your own way, 
but by feasting upon God and the right things to strengthen your strengths. I pray that you'll find it through community that you can maintain a level of victory and you can show it off, but to be able to stay strong, you need to come in community. And I pray that at, at the same time, you realize that the enemy isn't your circumstance, situation. There are hidden opportunities that God's given to you, and you need to fight the right battle the right way. Can we all stand right now before?